Hello everyone, uh, I'm JC and today I've got the pleasure to host Alain Pierre Lillo. His career was centered in innovation in multinational companies and at the moment is basically teaching innovation processes to both companies and uh, MBA students. And he's with us today to talk about innovation and diversity. Hello everybody, it's really a pleasure to be here in the Center of Innovation uh, at Google uh, in Mountain View. It's really a, a real honor for me to, to be able to share a little bit what I, I feel about innovation and I hope to share also what you feel about innovation, especially innovation and diversity. Uh, well, indeed, I've started my career as a physicist uh, in Schlumberger and uh, in that uh, company, I had the pleasure and uh, the, the honor to really to propose a new product starting from scratch, a product uh, where uh, Schlumberger was not in and it was a real uh, new product for a new market. It was in the, the 80s and it was a time when planes explode when they are flying because there are some bumps put inside containers inside the, the plane and I propose to develop a system which allows to uh, radioscopy the, uh, what is inside the containers. And the first system has been uh, uh, set up at Roissy Charles de Gaulle Airport, the Paris airport. The second one was put uh, for uh, Eurotunnel, the tunnel which is under the channel. And um, yes, it works, it works. Um, but it didn't find bumps, it find a lot of drugs and smugglings. And if I would have had the opportunity to, to get only one thousandth of the value of all the drugs found with this system, I would be very, very rich. Not like you guys of Google, because <laughs> uh, uh, you are very, very well paid and you, you deserve that. Uh, <coughs> and now this company is no more uh, inside uh, Schlumberger, but uh, it's, uh, another, it has been sold and it has, uh, uh, so uh, th their revenue is uh, between 150 and 250 million dollars every year. I have also been in touch with innovation as I manage uh, R&D center in the ceramic field uh, for Saint-Gobain. It was a R&D center with 250 engineers. Uh, and technician, and uh, uh, we succeed to increase the number of patents per engineer per year by a factor of 2.4. And it was mainly based on diversity. And it's why I'd like to share that a little bit with you today, if you don't mind. So, what is innovation? Well, innovation, you know all that, what is innovation. Uh, for me, it's mainly creativity in action, giving actual results. But uh, to give actual results, it means that we have to work as a team. It's rather seldom that now somebody could be an innovator by itself and starting from the idea, go to the market, being alone. So it's really a teamwork. And in teamwork, I think that uh, uh, what is important is first the culture. And a culture, an innovation is a culture to be developed. Uh, it implies organizational and managerial change, but also it's a process, and a process to be managed. Uh, it has to be planned, it has to be controlled. Uh, it, it is also some tools, project portfolio, concurrent engineering, project management, risk management, and so on. But what is important is that there is a continuum between really the culture to be developed and the process to be managed. Uh, it's also a non-linear process, innovation. Uh, you have large uncertainties when you innovate. I don't talk about development. Development is usually a linear process. You change a little bit the entry point and you will have a slight improvement or change in the output. But uh, in the... Uh, an, <coughs> an innovative process, it's you have very large uncertainties and a slight change in the initial condition means a lot at the end. And it has to be managed as a complex adaptive system. We need really to be agile, we need to be proactive, open to change. 
And you know that a complex adaptive system uh, in the systematic, systemic approach, the rule number one, uh, according to Joel de Rosny, is to keep or to increase variety. Okay, but which kind of diversity could we have? Well, definitely we can have diversity of projects. Of projects, we can have diverse projects with or uh, uh, with project portfolio. And in project for portfolio, well, well, the value of the project portfolio is really above the sum of the value of each individual project because it should be, we should have synergy. So uh, we can have diversity of project. We have also. Even if we have a diversity of projects, we have to break silos. Uh, you know, in some companies, I, uh, there are silos between the different teams. And uh, uh, if uh, we have only similar projects in the same silos, uh, we can have some consanguinity, and, uh, which means to aberration at the end and uh, no cross-fertilization. We can also have a diversity of organization. Well, for instance, uh, Triam, which is also known as a company, an innovative company, but in the field of uh, material science, uh, Triam has a motto, divide to grow. When somebody, so when somebody has uh, uh, in his team, somebody who wants to develop something new, he gives the opportunity or two of, to this guy to create his own team independent of the mother company. And it's, they call that dividing to grow. And it's good because, because uh, the paradigm that we are using when we are in a large established company and paradigm ne needed when to you start to grow a new business are definitely different. You don't have the same time constraint. You don't have the same needs to very quick decision. You don't have the need to quickly change your mind when you are in, and it's mandatory when you are in the innovative uh, part. Well, there was also other kind of uh, organization diversity. For instance, uh, uh, strategic alliance. When I've said uh, a few minutes ago that uh, we secure your tunnel, the tunnel between uh, UK and, uh, uh, and France. We, did, we didn't did that do that alone. We work with an American company called SAIC, and we put two devices together, what we developed in Schlumberger and what they developed in SAIC, and with those two devices and all the links we create between those two, we create a far more effective uh, product. And well, it could be also geographical uh, diversity, but what is the most important for me is that the people, it's the people who are innovative. It's the men, the women, and teams. And they are, as Corsi called, innovators. They are actors of the innovation. And uh, their diversity is important. There could be Diversity of culture, and we will come back to that. Uh, could be geographical training, jobs, functions, which are different. But there are also diversity of role and uh, a diversity of gender. And um, there are some interesting studies on this part showing that diversity of gender could be really a plus in innovative company. So concerning diversity of culture, well, first of all, it's perhaps good to have um, re to remember what culture is. And Shane, Shane is a, a professor at the MIT Sloan School uh, at Boston, and he, 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 the, his definition of culture is the way in which people solve problems and reconcile dilemmas. 
and uh, Trompeners, which is uh, really a specialist of intercultural management, and he is probably one of the uh, most known people in intercultural management. Uh, he defines culture as how contrasting values and conflicts are arbitrarily mediated. And uh, culture, culture it comes like layers, you know, like an, uh, layers in an onion. Uh, to understand it, you have to peel it. For instance, for instance, if uh, uh, well, you want to understand the American culture for European, uh, well, uh, you could say, okay, let's visit uh, New York, and we will see scrap skyscrapers. You will see lots of people running everywhere. And it can give you some idea that, uh, well, perhaps inside, below that, below that, what seems to be important, uh, what are the deeper values and norms in this society, uh, which are perhaps not directly visible, is uh, perhaps the more the better. Perhaps material successes. Well, for us, uh, it's but for Japanese, for instance, well, if you meet some Japanese, you, you may ask them, well, uh, uh, why, um, uh, why, when you are greeting, you bind yourself? The guy, uh, a guy could answer, well, because everybody do that in Japan. Okay. Or another one would say, well, maybe it's to show respect. Great. And why do you need to show respect? And he will smile, because he has no answer on that. That means that respect is really is in deep culture. It's, we will see that later, that having a different culture really helps to be innovative. Uh, we have seen that culture is important, but team members' role also is important. And uh, uh, Meredith Belbin uh, showed that in the 60s uh, that it's important. Uh, he showed that in successful innovative team, members must have complementary role, style, profiles, and working approaches. And how did he find that? It was amazing. Uh, he organized um, business simulation requiring uh, creative intelligence. And before doing those business simulation and before choosing the, the, uh, all those teams, well, he passed some tests like IQ test and so on to a large, bank, uh, a large set of people. And he was really surprised to see that this year he had six people with IQ above 160. Uh, so he was really surprised and he said, hey, with these people, there, there are 20 other team, but with those six people, I will call them the Apollo team. Because we were in the 60s, in the 60s, you know, sky, rocket, moon, Apollo. And he talked that for all those uh, uh, business simulation requiring uh, creative intelligence, they will do excellent job. And it was a disaster. They were, they really, those Apollo team was really the worst team of the 20 teams he set up. So he really tried to, under, to, to think about that. Does QI needs, means nothing? Why those so bright people could not manage business simulation when they, they need some creative intelligence? And, well, what he noticed that, he noticed that those people try all to have the same role. Those six people try all to be the manager. Because all their life has been considered as the brightest and the leaders. And so each time somebody presents an idea, the five others say to find all the things to show that his idea is not the good one and mine is the best one. And, uh, Belbing, Meredith Belbing, showed that there is 
idly nine types of role in an innovative team. And if you have only three people in the innovative team, it's not a problem. It means that if you want to succeed from time to time, you have to change your role or to have two roles at the same time. And three of those roles are in the idea field and three in the action field, three in the human relationship field. I won't, sp I won't uh, spend too much time to discuss each of those. But uh, just to let you know the importance not only of the designer, the guy who is creative and gets the idea, yeah, but it's also the importance of the critic. There's been, there's been uh, uh, a study by Stevens and all uh, in 99. And uh, this study is quite amazing because he analyzed 69 managers, uh, analysts, critics uh, during their career. Uh, and uh, he analyzed also the 267 projects they flow. And you know, he first uh, tried to uh, monitor all those critics by their creativity index. I don't talk about the creativity index, but they... And he looked at the success of the project followed by the critics, which by the 34 critics which were above the median, compared to the 34 critics which were below the median. And could you believe that, that the added value that uh, the payback of the project followed by the creative critics were on average 12 times above the added value, the payback of the critics which were below the, creative, uh, the, the, medium, uh, the, the median of uh, the, their creativity. So it's not, imp the designer is uh, very important, the critics is very important, others are important, you won't have really an innovation without the others, but don't forget this tough role of the, the critic. He kills ideas that are wasting the, ti the team's time, but he continuously improve ideas. He's sober, strategic, and discerning. He sees all the options and judge accurately. But often, he lack of drive and ability to inspire others. I won't talk about the others, but have in mind that the nine roles are important. And now, how team <coughs> diversity helps if we look to strategic marketing. After that, we will look to uh, innovation. Well, uh, multiple point of view uh, to listen and analyze small signals. That's obvious. Different sensibilities of customer needs. As Norman say, the easy part of prediction is technology. The hard part is social impact. So innovators have to bring aboard people with a better understanding of human foibles and have to build scenarios. And if you have people from different cultures, it really helps to build different scenarios. It really helps to understand human foibles and to have different points of view. It also helps to challenge ideas, and that's really the important <coughs> point. When we are in the same culture, well, something we consider as really a fact. We don't have to discuss. It's a, f it's a matter of fact that we have to do that. But people with different culture, but definitely they want, they want uh, to understand why people, uh, why you prefer to use this technology rather than that, to use this methodology rather than that. Nothing is keep as granted because you have people coming from different horizons. So they challenge ideas. And there is also cross-fertilization between uh, different paradigms. Well, look, 
look at those cars in the 50s. All have been developed 54, 55, 54, 55. And uh, there was another one, the DS-19, with a steering committee with aeronautic experience member. It doesn't look exactly the same than all the cars which are on the top of the slides. And it's a success. Well, they, were, they didn't have internet at that time, neither television, but the first day they sold 12,000 12, cars. And 1.5 million cars have been sold. But look also, totally new design. Aerodynamics. Use fiberglass and aluminium in 1955. Oleopneumatic suspension. Very nice comfort at that time. Very in incomparable road holding, large windows, no radiator grill. Look at the radiator grill here compared to the, 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 the cars upstairs. A monobranch driving wheel and so on. But what is important is that in this steering company, steering committee, in a car company, they put some people from aeronautic, with aeronautic experience, with aeronautic skills. And ex Well, when you analyze strategic, bad strategic marketing decision, you can see a lot of reasons, but definitely there are three which often come. It's the problem is not well raised. There is a search of consensus and a collective decision. There is lack of vision and lack of meaning. And if you have a multicultural staff with members who challenge hypotheses, they ask you why. Why do you think that? Why shall it improve our customer's life? Why uh, does it make sense? Who will use it? Why? Why? They check meanings and they keep sense of perspective. And I would like to show you something which happens in the end of the 90s and beginning of the 20s. And uh, I was one of the actors of that, and I suffer a lot of this solutions, the, these issues. Uh, it's uh, the time of the, uh, well, okay. It, it was uh, the, the time of um, the, uh, the, the internet boom. And uh, in, uh, I think it was in 98, the DOC wrote a paper, Emerging Digital Technologies. And they claim in this paper that the internet traffic is doubling every 100 days. And it was based on false information. Uh, false information provided by WorldCom uh, whose leaders have interest to talk up figures. In November, November 2000, just, just one month after RHK, which is one of the best known company for market analysis in uh, all the optical fiber telecom network, uh, put this report. Uh, and uh, in November, Odizico, a guy from AT&T, showed tra that traffic of internet is not doubling every 100 days, but it's doubling every year. You can say, OK, it's, it's growing, indeed. But if you, grow, if you double every year, after three years, you have, you, your traffic has been multiplied by eight. But if you double every 100 day, after three years, your traffic should increase by a factor of 2,000. You see the difference. And really, I was a manager of a company which was providing wafers, wafer slice of a special uh, crystal that we manufacture. 
and to pro provide some, uh, uh, some optical component uh, which are used in, uh, uh, in uh, optical network. And well, we decided in 1999 to, uh, to invest four times our sales, four times our sales for, new, for building a new plant. Because of that. And everybody trusts that. Average growth rate, 51%. Well, if we are looking only to the optical component sales, the growth was 28% per quarter. And we, we really see this grow. Our growth was more than 30% per quarter. And uh, RHK Actual, in November 2002, so two years after, some guys say, hey, be careful. It's not every year, that, uh, every one of the day that it's doubling, but every year. Just after he said that, there is a decrease by 40% a quarter. You can imagine, that's what RHK forecast in October 2000, what they really saw. You can imagine CapEx write-off. It was a waste of billions, billions of dollars on all over the world because, because we don't ask why, why, why. So having a multicultural staff really help to ask questions. Now coming back to innovation process by itself, well, often we say that we have first to generate variety, interact, involve, and then select and develop and learn. And it's like a little bit the process of the life. Uh, uh, we, there is diversity of approach, diversity of strategies, uh, multiple projects, ID clash, merge, and selection development uh, you, with some gates, and then learning process. And in the life, the learning process is done through the DNA. But, uh, well, we have this, and you know that, we have to sow enough seeds to select the best plants, and innovation is also a game, a number game, and we need to have a large number of ideas. Uh, ten person may pass the feasibility gate, three person will pass the technical success, and one, one will be probably a real success. But, uh, and uh, I think that in Google you, you, you are very proud to say that uh, uh, it's not important to fail, what is important is to try. And, uh, and I like also the, this Linus polling uh, sentence, the best way to get a good idea is to get a lots of idea. Uh, and what really matters is the value of your success and not how many times you failed so far. And definitely more innovation ideas from, come from multicultural staff, mainly due to cross-fertilization process, shock of idea. Uh, well, at, at saint gobain cré this R&D center uh, uh, on the ceramics uh, in south of France, uh, well, we increased by 2.5 or 2.4 the number of patents per employee per year. But we also multiply, uh, we also, at the starting point, had only six person of foreigners in our staff. Five years later, we were 30 person of staff which were foreigners. I love French people, but when they are working here, in Mountain View, or in Berlin, or, or in Tokyo, because they didn't have the same uh, culture, but they don't have the same uh, training, uh, and they don't have the same uh, experience, so there is clash of idea and innovation. Uh, I, I was also I, in this uh, in this team when I arrived. There was also lots of silos 
because Saint Gobain bought a lot of company in the ceramic field, and uh, uh, well, all those uh, managers wanted to uh, to be sure that, 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 that what they developed is for their company, and they start to be a little bit a conglomerate of ceramics company, and it was not good for Saint Gobain, so they decide to create a R&D center. And one was already existing in Northborough in the States, uh, close to Boston, and they create another one in, in Europe. And uh, uh, even that, the, 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 even if it was mandatory to do the R&D in the same, uh, in the same center, uh, center uh, people were working in silos. And I, my job was to break the silos. And for instance, I, I create a joint lab with CNRS, which is a, a national lab, a very large national lab in France. It's the largest national lab in France. I don't remember how many uh, researchers there, have, but uh, it's probably uh, above 25,000. And we, we create a, a joint lab, and I impose that the manager of this joint lab will be a guy from the CNRS and not a guy from saint -Gobain. Because if I choose somebody from the Alpha Lab, this joint lab will work only for the Alpha Lab. Same for the Delta Lab or the Gamma Lab. And really, indeed, the joint lab start to break the silos. And myself, when uh, I was in a technical meeting and I see that uh, the Beta team has some difficulties which has been solved by the Gamma team a few months earlier, I gave a call immediately to the boss of Gamma and saying, hey, your colleague from Beta will come and meet you to discuss something similar that you showed me three months ago. And I'd like to, have, uh, to be part of the, this meeting. If I can't, well, do the meeting and I want to see the report. And it starts to cut the silos. And with all that kind of cross-fertilization, having people from outside, also having a better motivation, well, we increase, we multiply the, the patterns by 2.4. And well, indeed, uh, having diverse team favor divergence process. Trying shock of idea, Dif different thinking, creativity. It's also helped to develop your mental elasticity because when you are talking with people who are used to talk as you, to think as you, you don't develop your mental elasticity. But if you are talking with people who have never, who, who don't have the same way of thinking, well, you are obliged to, um, to move your neural network, neural cells, and to try to be more, uh, uh, increase your mental elasticity, you increase your agility, and you also share building roles. It helps also to challenge ideals and kill non-invented here attitude. When I developed the Sikoscan, the system in Schlumberger, after six months, I received only a few, uh, a, a few ten thousand uh, dollars to start the, the R&D. After that, I received ten billion, ten million to develop the product. But at the beginning, um, uh, it was only a feasibility study. And my boss say that, hey, please, after you have done your feasibility study, discuss this with Sharpak. And Sharpak at that time didn't have yet his Nobel Prize, but he was very well known in the field I had to work with. And uh, I went to CERN in Geneva and showed uh, the, the result to Sharpak. And he said, oh, it's impossible to have a cathode which is only three millimeters from the anode. It's impossible. It, it won't never work. Uh, we, we know for sure that it has to be at least nine millimeters. And I say, OK, sir. Okay, professor, but, well, I was not aware about that. I'm sorry, I was not aware. I did it, and it worked. And I show you, him, all the plan, the drawing, and the actual results. Well, having people, I was not in this field. I was not in this field. It's because I didn't know that it could not work that I did it. So if you have people from different horizon, you have more opportunity to, to create something new. So yes, uh, I already talked about cross-fertilization between uh, different technology and break silos. And now I think that it's probably the most important part of my talk. For complex decision-making problem, heterogeneous 
groups produce higher quality solution than homogeneous groups. And it's Hoffman. Hoffman would show that. Well, he tests groups of people. And uh, during uh, six months each time, each group met once a week during half a day. And uh, they have to deal with a different type of complex situation. Conflict, interest conflict, uh, of a conflict of interest, conflict of value, and so on. And each time it was a group of, uh, I don't remember, four people. And he had uh, 16 groups which were homogeneous in terms of past experience, in terms of study people have done, in terms of uh, social uh, way of life. And it has also 25 very heterogeneous groups. And what does he show is that for nearly all the problem, th there was only one problem when it's nearly the same for the result for homogeneous and heterogeneous uh, uh, was nearly the same. But for all the other problems, the heterogeneous group was far superior, far superior. And furthermore, he wonder if having a, a diverse team would create some frustration because there was more arguments between people and it was not the case. People were very motivated, keep to be very motivated. They were satisfied with the way they solved the problem, even if it was perhaps more, more difficult at the beginning. So having a heterogeneous group has no impact on motivation. Because from time to time we hear that having an homogeneous group is better for motivation. Well, Hoffman showed that it's not the case. So, innovation is really a collective process, as I told you. Innovation is a collective process because a team carries out more than the sum of talent that each member can contribute, and it's the importance of teamwork. And uh, I'd like to see how team diversity helps also teamwork. And really, it favors collective intelligence. Uh, and collective intelligence, uh, as shown in uh, just last year, that. Uh, it's weakly correlated to the number of people, but it's strongly correlated to links, interaction, and data idea exchange between uh, people. And there was also a very nice study done in 2010 by Anita Woolley, and uh, she showed that group performance are weakly correlated with the average or maximum individual intelligence of group members, weakly correlated. There is some correlation, but it's weak. So even if you have a boss with an IQ, uh, IQ of 160 and uh, all the team at 140, okay, it's a plus, but it's not the only stuff. She also showed that it's strongly correlated with the uh, average social sensibility the equality of distribution uh, of conversation turn talking and on gender uh, diversity, it's correlated to how you interact with the others. So if you have a strong boss who doesn't let the others to talk, probably even if he's the brightest and if his team is really bright, they won't have in complex decision not an as good uh, results than people who are actively talking to each other and with people who are coming from diverse uh, fields. And uh, well, you know probably this sentence uh, uh, from Menken, uh, for every complex problem there is a solution that is clear, simple, plausible and, and wrong. 
And uh, yes, in terms of uh, strategy, have a diverse team help because, because uh, uh, you ask yourself, or the staff in the uh, in diverse team ask yourself, why, why, why? We avoid to, have a, to, to get a consensus on a clear, simple and plausible solution. We favor posi positive questioning. We help to challenge ideas. As Einstein said, the important thing is not to stop questioning. And it favors agility and ease change management. It favors development of mental elasticity. Yes, we are already talked. And indeed, for complex decision making problems, heterogeneous groups produce higher quality solutions than homogeneous groups. And now, as a conclusion, team diversity matters. Yes, indeed. To get a larger choice when recruiting. If you want to have only people who are coming from this school, uh, you have a lower, but that's a detail. For broad customer understanding, yes, it's important to get new skill. It's important to have contrasting perspective. It's important to get more point of view, to understand customer needs is also very important. But what is more important? Idea generation for cross-fertilization, constructive cl conflict and stimulating debates which solve problems through a creative path. Agility, to be more flexible and open to change. And you will feel that and probably where you have a very diverse team here in Google, you feel that and you benefit from that. And finally for complexity. As I told you, for complex problem, uh, it doesn't work really for development. It's not too complex for development. Yes, it's difficult. But for development, you don't need to have a diverse team. But when you want to innovate, having a diverse need is really important. And uh, uh, I would like to thank you. And I'm ready to answer all questions or comments that uh, you you have. And uh, some questions from the other plants? Maybe some comments? So you mentioned that um, you talked about um, these nine different roles in innovation, the critic, the perfectionist, and so forth. And, and you talked about the beneficial um, aspects of the critic. But you know, like the critic, I sometimes found critics sometimes add a lot of negative value because you know they are indiscriminately being critics. So there's there's this good side and there's you know, the negative side to it, where I can definitely see how they can filter out the, you know, things that really don't matter or, or are wasting time, but sometimes they can be like overly aggressive. I agree with you, uh, but remember, I show you also that they've done some, uh, uh, some uh, review of 69 well-known critic in a large multinational company. And they look at what is the creativity, the creativity level of the critics themselves. And they look at, uh, they, they put them on a row and they look from the less creative critic to the most creative critic. And they look at the value of the 34 which were above the medium and the 30 compared to the 34 below the medium. And you are totally right. If you have a critic which is only looking at, at the difficult points, not seeing all the opportunity, you will be on the bad side. And the value of the innovation he has to check is really low. The value was 12 times, the, the, the average value 
uh, of the project uh, supervised by the, the, the 34 critics which has a high creativity level was 12 times above the value of those who were too negative. Another question? So, uh, usually in companies, when they say diversity, they usually are referring to gender diversity or uh, cultural diversity. Or they from different ethnic background, different cultures, different backgrounds. So, I mean, I, I was. Uh, hoping to see uh, some examples about how gender diversity actually uh, plays role or gender uh, diversity. Uh, so is there a study of that sort? Or? The Anita Woolley uh, article uh, which was written in 2010, so uh, show effect uh, that indeed having gender di diversity helps in innovation and, uh, and uh, uh, one of the explanation of that is that having uh, having uh, gender diversity in a team means that people uh, feel obliged to listen a little bit more than if they are only women or only men. But uh, she shows mainly that uh, adding a woman in a team have a real improvement, create a real improvement. Surprising, but it's, uh, it's what she showed. And uh, well, the, the, the slides will be uh, on your network and I've put some reference on that. So you can, uh, uh, the last three pages are only reference and uh, you, you, you can have a look on this uh, articles if you want. Other question? Okay, thank you very, very much for inviting me here. I, it was a real pleasure to be here and to share a little bit of uh, what innovation is and the importance of diversity in a good innovative team. Thanks.